Thanks. Um, this is really terrifying. I think throughout the day I've been sitting there watching and as each kind of brilliant person follows another brilliant person showing amazing things. And there's just this part of me where, where my inner sort of sense of mediocrity has just been throbbing all day long. And it's kind of, it's got pretty, pretty kind of bad now. And unfortunately, where that thing ended is, is kind of where my, where my sort of story begins. Because I think what, what I'm going to share with you is a little bit a story of kind of, I guess, love that turned to loss, that turned to hatred, and, and hopefully kind of finds its way back to hope again about what's happened to the world of, of digital advertising. Um, before we start, I think, you know, just a little bit of background. I think, thank you for that wonderful introduction. That's far too kind. Um, uh, as Mike from Man vs. Machine said earlier, th this thing of, you know, being an executive anything means that there's just too many levels. And as an executive creative director, I can wholeheartedly agree. Um, and I am absolutely, as uh, Mike is a designer, I am absolutely not a designer, as you'll see as my slides start to reveal themselves. Um, and, you know, my, my voyage really through this industry has been one of, of mainly cheating and blagging. And a, a tip for anyone who wants to become a creative director, the best thing you can do is set up your own agency and then you can call yourself a creative director because no one can stop you. And then from that point forward, you can also, like, just keep blagging your way as a creative director. Um, and th this presentation I'm about to do is kind of a bit reflective of me. It's, it's you know, slightly geeky in places. There's a ranty bit in the middle, and it might not make sense always, but, but kind of hang in there. So, you know, re really, this is, this is kind of how I started out in the world. Just everything was fucking awesome. Like, it, it just so good. You know, I was the most optimistic kind of lover of the future and, and everything, you know, and I believe that the internet gave everyone the power to, to sort of change the world. Um, and some, but something's gone wrong, and, and, and now I'm more like this guy, um, <laughs> kind of pretty much cowering in the corner, pretending that it's all going to go away, praying that I'll never again be presented with an idea that features a pointless drone in it. So I don't know, like, what, what's happened over the, this kind of this, this time? And, you know, the internet used to be this kind of really nice, quiet, small place where it was, it was actually like, pretty easy. It's like anything that was good or interesting or beautiful would, would get picked up and, and, and shared around. And, and of course, funny stuff kind of had a massive part to play. And you know, something like this, which is interesting, funny, beautiful, um, you know, would, have, would have basically made the internet kind of you know, completely explode. And I was sort of thinking about what was the first thing I remember being sent kind of as a, as a viral video. And, and I, and I found this, not this, the thing I'm about to put forward. Um, and, and look at this, and remember that this came out four or five years before YouTube existed. And, and you sort of wonder, how on earth did things get sent around? And I remember getting this as like a little MPEG clip. Um, just, just watch it. I'm sure you've all seen it. Oh. At the river mouth, the bears catch only the tastiest, most tender salmon. Which is exactly what we at John West want. John West endured the worst to bring you the best. And it was, it was just an ad. I mean, it's got a great, the best bear roundhouse of any piece of video I think I've ever seen. But, you know, that's apparently been seen, someone's sort of tried to work it out. It's been seen more than 300 million times and kind of in a, in a sort of time before YouTube. That's pretty fucking incredible. But I think what's happened is it was sort of a bit like, a bit like the same way that music has evolved and a bit like the same way that, um, that nightclubs have evolved. I'm, I was trying to find an example of this. And, and this is actually a bit of a set from, um, from Boiler Room that I came across the other day. It's a, it's a, a German DJ called, called Ankle Pants. Um, and th this is kind of how I feel about how the, how the internet can, can be these days. I utterly the music. Apparently, this is an amazing prosthetic face that actually the dildo nose kind of responds to the music, and uh, it gets very, very technically complicated and, and kind of admirable from that respect. But if you look at the people there, no one's having a good time. They're just all utterly, 
They're just utterly bemused at what's going on. And then I sort of look back to, you know, I'm too old to go out anywhere now, but like, it, you know, when, when I was growing up, you'd go to a nightclub and it would, it would, when it was good, it would be more like this. <laughs> Everyone knew when that piece of piano was going to happen because people had been playing the same record week in, week out, no matter what club that you went to, and there was just this kind of shared sense of ownership. Of course, fucking shed loads of drugs, but we'll kind of, well, that, was, that was just a separate part of the story. But there was a thing about shared experience and that we all knew what we, were kind of, what we were all kind of into, whereas now, you know, DJ Ankle Pants, you kind of turn up and it's like, all right, what, what's, what's going on? Um, and then we sort of had this thing where, where I think what happened to the web was that, um, that like money came along and algorithms came along and people started trying to figure out who, to decide who should see what, whereas early on like, social media wasn't really there, it was like you had a much smaller group of people and I would send emails to my mates and that was fine. And, you know, and, and now there was, when the money started to show up, people were like, okay, there's money in people's attention, there's money in figuring out who should see what, and people got really smart about it. And, and they, people who created content started to get really good at sort of feeding us things that they knew that our weak kind of like ape-like brains would just fall for. Um, and that's why, you know, things like the 33 whitest ads in the history of mankind are so successful because they've been genetically engineered to be shareable bits of content. And, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's you know, we're in this kind of cloud of sort of terrible content. And that's why... I thank you so much to the, the guys at places like It's Nice That for actually being a layer of curation that doesn't fall for the, the tricks of listicles and, and everything else. So I would like to kind of give you a small round of applause to It's Nice That for keeping the internet good. Um, and this is not, this is, this is partly just because I'm becoming an old fart, but, and I'm not just wishing that the internet would go back to what it was and I'll kind of get round to that, but I think I've got a sort of, a bit of a theory about the worst parts of, of what's driving this forward. And I don't know, many of you will have, seen, will have seen this quote, and it's definitely something that I've used in presentations in the past, and you know, it, it's sort of become a cliche now, but Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced te technology is indistinguishable from magic, which, is, which I think was kind of true. Um, and then this guy, Alan Kay, who's a sort of really important and influential computer scientist, was a fellow at Apple and an early guy at Xerox Park, and you know, says smart things. But he said that technology is anything that are, wasn't around when you were born. So I thought, what happens if you put those two statements together? And it basically means that stuff that was around when you were born is not magic. And you kind of look back now, and I'm on the wrong side of 40, so computers, game consoles, you know, watches with calculators in them, all that stuff was magic to me. But now, you know, if, if you're any... Like, the internet isn't a novel new thing now. You, you know, you, what, if you're under 20, it was there when you were born. It doesn't even exist as a concept to people. It's just like air, right? So, so fetishizing how the internet is and how it works, is, or, or mobile or whatever, it's just dumb. And I think as an industry, and, I, and I'm talking specifically about advertising, but I think some of you, from, if you come from sort of, I guess, commercial creativity, you might start to recognize some of this. But I think... As an industry, advertising has become obsessed with, with, sort of, with innovation, and I put those sneer quotes in there for, for good reason, because you know, I, I don't know what it is about innov innovation that's so important to us. Clearly, it's a, it's a very potent kind of creativity, um, and we get really excited by it. And I think the, the big problem is that um, I, I blame, not, I'm not blaming Cannes specifically, but I blame this culture of, of, of winning awards. And I think what's happened is, because, culture, because the media's become really fragmented, it's actually really hard to kind of make dents in culture. And I think that's when, when you, you know you're doing good work, it's when you feel it resonating through culture. And because now people aren't watching TV in the same way, and people aren't tuned into the same channels, actually creating things that feel like they've made a, a sizable dent in culture is really hard to do. So I think creative people have, have started kind of feeling like failures, and they've started to look to other places for recognition and, and self-worth. And, and awards are this kind of easy thing. It's like, I won an award, therefore my work is, is, is good. And that's clearly not what this is all about. And, and I think what happens is, in, in, in our industry, is people start to give awards to the work that they think shows advertising in a good light. And, and, and I put this image in yesterday, and, and now 
I'm looking at this, uh, looking at the book cover in a completely different light after the, the talk earlier, and I, I'll study it properly when I get home. But, but what's happened is people have got obsessed with the story of the thing, not the thing itself that you're making. I'll get onto this in a minute. But I, and I love stories. Um, you know, I work at a company that, that, that prides itself in, in telling great, great stories. What I don't like are, are inauthentic, boring stories. And I think the worst of these stories that are sort of floating to the surface now in, in our industry and the world are these stories of kind of almost like faux innovation. Um, and I made a really big error here because I, I put this image in and, to, and, and then I looked at it again and I was like, this isn't showing faux innovation, this is showing real innovation. <laughs> this is... <laughs> This is a beer arm that let you dance like an idiot without spilling a drop of beer. It's clearly the future of everything. Um, but you'll know, I'm going to show some examples of what I consider to be kind of faux innovation in a minute. Uh, and and it, you'll know it when you see it, and it's normally described in our world as, as the world's first something. And if you've been, missed, if you've been sort of, uh, I guess, sort of unfortunate enough to have to sit through any um, advertising case studies, you'll have seen the world's first this. So, for example, I, you know, uploaded in, in last year, in 2014, the world's first public interview. By the way, I'm not picking on any of this work specifically, so if any of you have anything to do with this, or friends that have anything to do with this work, I'm about to be mean about, it's not personal, it's just, they're just examples. Um, but so this was uploaded in 2014, claiming to be the world's first public interview. But in 2005, some of you re may remember, this guy was doing public interviews. It definitely wasn't the world's first public interview. Um, and then, uh, the, well, this was a weird thing. <laughs> I was trying to find a picture of Donald Trump because the American Apprentice came before the other one. And on Google Images, this was an image of so-called a Donald Trump image, which I thought was was too brilliant not to put in a presentation. Um, so more world's first. So in 2012, someone claimed to have the world's first live online game show. Clearly not true. But then you've got this other thing where it's like you can be really specific and go, we've got the world's first crowdsourced bar built by nothing but a love of Jack Daniels. And it's like, I could claim to have created the world's first fire made by a guy called Ian Tate. It doesn't make it, it, doesn't make it the world's first anything particularly. Um, well, and of course, when you do something really specific, so you, you can guarantee a first. The other thing is, if you do something really strange, you can claim to be the first, and also probably the last. Uh, this is the world's first headbang-triggered beer dispenser, uh, a case study from, for Kingfisher. I honestly can't imagine there'll be a world's second headbang-triggered <laughs> beer dispenser anywhere in the world, but again, I could, could be wrong. And that's not to say that all of this stuff is wrong. Like, I, I liked the first organ donor card for a football team. I thought that was, I thought that was, was quite nice. Um, but come on, the world's first talking tile grout. Like, I'm not making this stuff up. This is an actual case study. And after this bit, it kind of goes on to show people kind of coding the bag of talking tile grout and things. And you're like, no. Like I said, I'm not signaling this out for ridicule because, you know, we've, we've, we've all done it and I'm probably more guilty than most. I actually went back and found this thing we did for Orange that actually in the corner of the website that we built, it says the world's first internet balloon race. So, um, guilty, guilty as charged. And, you know, we did a GPS-enabled cow in a field, the world's first one of those. And um, a car racing game across mobile phones probably, probably said that was the world's first. And, you know, it's fun to do that. And it's, and it's sort of, it's, it's interesting sort of R&D sometimes. And it ticked, it, sometimes it kind of, you know, it, it, early adopters kind of like it. But really most of it's done basically in the, for the same reason that we do 33, uh, 33 examples of the whitest dads in the universe. So basically what we've, what we've come to is we've come to this kind of weird thing of hype overload. And it's time to say that enough's enough. And, I don't know how many of you know this, um, this shape. So this shape is kind of well-known, relatively well-known kind of tech circles and some financial circles. It's called the Gartner Hype Cycle. And I'll take you through it. In 2014, it kind of looks roughly like this. So they've got you know, quantum computing here and then speech recognition over here and the Internet of Things is up at the top and then big data. And I'll, I'll show you what each of the points on this curve means because they're all quite significant. So the first thing, right down at the bottom at the beginning of the curve is the technological trigger. And that's what happens, you know, if you're, if you're lucky enough to be somewhere kind of weird in a laboratory with people with massive brains. Um, this is like an anti-gravity Mebius strip that means that, you know, things we can travel in time in the future. But that's kind of, that's, that's real kind of innovation happening down there, the technological bit. Then what happens is stuff rises up and it reaches this um, peak of inflated expectations. <laughs> And, and that's the moment where everyone goes, holy shit, QR codes are the future of everything. Everything has to have a QR code on it. 
And then you go, oh, the trough of disillusionment, which is this bit at the bottom where you go, oh, wait, like, like what, was, what was good about that thing again? It seems pretty pointless or, you know, it just, it, it just like no one can be bothered with it anymore. And then there's the slope of enlightenment. And like from the pits of despair, someone says, oh, that thing that we thought was rubbish, that actually might be quite good. And people are starting to adopt it and maybe we should think about it a bit more. And then you get to the good bit where it's the plateau of productivity, which is the bit where everyone goes, yeah, yeah, I, I, of course, I always knew that WhatsApp was going to be worth $16 billion. I never thought that was a silly idea. And you know, it was really obvious that more people would send WhatsApp messages than text messages in 2015. And it's the bit where you kind of almost look back and go, that thing couldn't not be true. And so this is kind of, again, that's what it looks like in, in 2014. And I'm not saying that this is complete, you know, it's always not completely accurate. And you go back and you, and you can find these all on Google Images and go back through the years and kind of go, they got it like 50% right at best. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily choose what to do with my life based on what sits where. But if you go, if you go back and look at it, like what happens is, I think we realize that, or I realize that the advertising industry is obsessed with this peak of inflated expectations, and we don't care enough about the kind of the, the, the productivity plateau, which is, I think, the bit where our kind of audiences actually are. And so I think my, my point is really that what we all need to do is kind of start saying no to the world's first and start really focusing on, on the world's best stuff. And that's what's been great about, for, for me, someone who's in advertising coming to this today. And you see people with real integrity and passion for what they do, making wonderful, beautiful things and not worrying about, about the hype. They're just doing what they love. And you know, there was, whether I agree or disagree, I thought you know, Show Studio putting out one hour, 45 minute long videos is, is like a really good example of that. And uh, you know, just do the things that feel right to you and that, and that feel, you know, people out there will love it. And I think one of the, one of the hard things um, is, is, is YouTube view accounts, I think, has basically pushed us to a really weird place. There's this very public thing that says whether what you've made has been successful or not. I think people are obsessed by that. And so they're constantly pushing to do stuff that's going to get big numbers, whether that's the right thing to, to, to do or not. So you know, I, I love what YouTube has, has done to democratize, democratize kind of content, but I think those numbers are a real trap that people fall into sometimes. Um, so you know, I, th I think we should start to think about you know, what's the most authentic, what's the longest running thing? Like that's something that no one ever talks about in our industry. It's like people don't make version two, version three, they want to throw it away because you don't win prizes for a second version of a thing, so people, people don't want to make that work. And I think that's total bullshit. I think we should start to reward things that have been going for a long time that people continue to evolve and grow and, and love and kind of tend to. Um, you know, and, and I think this is a thing that we need to kind of, um, in, you know, instead of making drones, I think there's, there's huge things and areas where, where sort of, I guess the kind of the, the commercial creative industries, especially advertising, really haven't done very much with. And, and, and my, my big bugbear is, is, is gaming, right? Gaming, everyone knows the stats about gaming. This is, um, this game some of you may have seen, I, I hope some of you have seen. It's a game called Muscle March that's available on the Wii U. <laughs> and, uh, it's the weirdest, most Japanese kind of homoerotic like thing in, in the universe. But <laughs> I could just watch it all day. Um, but, you know, so so we, we all know that the video games are basically bigger than music and movies combined, but you'll, never, you'll very rarely hear someone in an advertising agency or someone at a big brand going, I know, let's do something with video games, where of course if you did something with a musician or something with music that, or with, with film, they would completely understand that world and they would be comfortable doing it, even though the potential audience is, is, is smaller and you know, those industry, like the music industry especially is kind of in a real problematic place, whereas the gaming industry is kind of on a massive, a massive ascent. So it's just weird that we're still kind of looking backwards and, and, and not focusing on the things which you know, may have seemed like they were sort of innovative and different, but are actually mainstream and everyday now. And I think one of the sort of the biggest myths in, in, in sort of the world of creativity is that it's going to be okay because there's this bunch of people coming through, probably most of you, like they're digital natives, they've grown up with this stuff and they're going to come and riding in on horseback and save us. But you know, I grew up watching, watching TV. I can't make TV ads. It's like, you know, it's not just because you do it every day. It doesn't mean that you're kind of, that you're exploring the limits of the creativity of those things. And you know, and, and so these, you know, millennials aren't gonna ride in and kind of, and kind of save us all. It, you know, 
uh, what I think is really hopeful about, about younger people coming in now have grown up with this stuff is they can remind old people like me that this stuff isn't important or special. It's just everyday and normal. It's just what people do. And I think that's the, that's the one thing I want to kind of leave people with is just this sense that, you know, digital isn't important or magic or special. Yes, you can do wonderful things with it, but to most people outside of our industry, it's just how stuff works and it's just ordinary and everyday. So these people are not going to save us but they are going to remind us that uh, oh, <coughs> they're not going to save us. Um, but, they, but they will be a good reminder that, that, that they don't think that it's magic. And actually, so some of that kind of everydayness needs to infect what we do. So I think, you know, look at these things that, have, uh, that are now of a scale where there is, you know, that they're more impactful. They're more, they're more important. I think, to a generation than television. And I look at most advertising agencies and I go, that at the time that you guys were formed, TV was this, or, and even print were these kind of emergent media where you could kind of do interesting stuff and experiment and have fun. But if you were setting up today, like culture isn't being formed on television. Culture, I mean, yes, TV's having a kind of renaissance, but it's basically, it's basically like movies chopped up into smaller chunks for people to watch on Netflix. So there's great stuff happening and great content being made, but it isn't, it isn't, they're not emergent channels to me. So I think do interesting things on the platforms that are the new mass media. But be cool about it. Don't try and fuck it up. Like, it, it's funny, when I was, when I was at, um, so this is a piece of work that was around uh, a, a few years ago, and I remember it was really kind of, it sticks out to me as a kind of seminal moment of, of what, do, what, what to do at one moment in time and then totally what not to do um, in 2015. And what it was, it was an ad for um, uh, another video game, um, Wario Land. And the whole thing was about, you know, the, you had to shake the controller really fast. And they did this really smart thing where you're watching on YouTube and all of a sudden as the shaking happened, the page started to kind of fall apart. But what that spawned was a breed of imitations. of like, I know, let's make the guy jump out of the banner and set fire to the page that someone's reading. Well, that's not going to annoy anyone, is it? It's like people are so obsessed with like impact and breaking formats that um, they lost any sense of like beauty or truth or like interest or anything. It was just about just disrupting people's attention. And I think when advertising is bad, that's what it tries to do. It just tries to kind of insert itself in, in people's way. And I think. Um, you know, as designers or creative people or, or, or whatever you call yourself, our job is to actually be part of people's lives, not like, a, not like an interruption and a, and a kind of and a moment that people want to kind of run away from. Um, and, you know, this is, a piece of, this is a piece of work that I'm sort of wrongly kind of attributed to having a, a large amount to do with. I mean, my, my, my involvement with this work was the TV ad existed, and when I joined the team in Portland, they said to me, oh, we're gonna make an iPhone app with, the, with, with this guy in it. And I was like, what, why are you gonna do that? Like, everyone loves him on YouTube, and he's perfect. Like, he stands there and he talks to people on YouTube. Why don't you just let him reply to people on YouTube? And they were like, oh yeah, we could do that. That would be good, wouldn't it? So, so they did that, and, you know, and, and the rest is, is history. And you know, what, what's interesting about that is you do something uh, and the way that we put it out there, you know, we, we, we sort of found communities that already had a bit of kind of interest in him or that had interesting followings. So we did stuff with Reddit. And I think that the biggest thing for me with this was like a real moment that, that was really nerve wracking, but, but incredibly uh, important was the team reached out to 4chan and basically did a thing for 4chan, which as you probably know is like the toxic pit, pit of the internet where people are more likely to kind of, you know, sort of launch an all out war on you than they are to kind of applaud it. But there was something about the way that this had been done and, the, and, and the sort of the fact that we were sympathetic to the media, that they got really behind it and they started, you know, they started kind of interacting with it and making their own stuff. And I think, I think it was Reddit, the, the sort of Reddit again, sort of similarly kind of questionable sort of place to, to, to put advertising. You know, they, they made like a ringtone generator using his responses and like they, they really kind of got behind it. And you know, you saw when you put things out there in that way, you know, it spawned just tons and tons of imitation. And that's because it was something that was accessible and, and, and um, you know, people could, people could kind of play along with. Um, so I think that's what I mean when I, when I say kind of be, be respectful and be cool with the channels that are out there because you can do amazing stuff, but it's not about fighting against them and trying to break them. It's about working with these things and, and, and really kind of making the most of them. Um, so, you know, whether you're an artist or a designer or a technologist or a scumbag in advertising, like it's all, this, it's all the same deal. It's about making things that people care about, not stories about things that no one's going to care about tomorrow. And I think the most important thing, and I, I've always sort of said this, I, I think this may make me sound like a really weird hippie, but I really think that kind of have, people having fun with stuff actually travels 
through the internet, like in a really interesting way. So I think you can tell when someone's cared about something and put passion into it and love into it, and, that, and they've had fun making it. And I think, it, I think people pick up on that, and, and that's, what makes, that's what genuinely, in my mind, makes things, kind of, makes things viral and makes things have a, kind of a, a life beyond where they, where they initially start. So go out there, do amazing stuff, have fun doing it, and thank you very much.